Hello, and um, thank you so much for joining us in this, the final event uh, that exploring the uh, British Museum's Nero exhibition before the exhibition draws to a close next week. And I do absolutely recommend a visit to the exhibition um, before the end, before it closes. It's a, a really intriguing um, exploration of the figure of Nero. Um, I'm Charlotte Higgins, I'm the Chief Culture Writer of The Guardian and a uh, classicist and it's my huge pleasure to introduce uh, the speakers that we have with us tonight to think about uh, Nero as populist, to explore the idea of whether it's useful to think about Nero through the frame of populism. So our speakers tonight are Tom Holland, who's an award-winning historian, translator, broadcaster, and he's the author of numerous, numerous fantastic books, including Dynasty, uh, The Rise and Fall of the House of Caesar, which is perhaps the most relevant work for tonight. But also he wrote his brilliant book, Rubicon, about the uh, final days of the Roman Republic. And uh, he is translating Suetonius at the moment for Penguin Classics will be published next year and he's also the host of the wonderful podcast which I totally recommend you listen to the rest is history um Catherine Edwards Professor Catherine Edwards uh, uh, has been a chair at um, a, um, at Birkbeck in ancient history since 2006 and she's occupied many distinguished posts including being president of the Roman society. She's published extensively on Roman cultural history and the reception of Roman antiquity. And her books include Death in Ancient Rome and the Politics of Immorality in Ancient Rome. And she has translated Suetonius's Lives of the Caesars for Oxford World's Classics. So we have a head to head here of uh, Suetonius translators for Penguin and for Oxford World Classics. We'll be able to take our pick. Um, and our final speaker tonight is Will Davis, who is Professor um, um, in Politics at uh, Goldsmiths University of London. Um, he's the author of This Is Not Normal, The Collapse of Lib Liberal Britain, which was published last year, and Nervous States, How Feeling Took Over the World, which was published in 2018. Um, he writes regularly for the London Review of Books and The Guardian, and it's a particular pleasure um, that I was able to wrangle him into this event because I think he's just one of the most uh, percipient untanglers of the particular political state we're in at the moment and he's written really beautifully about populism and the kind of decline of liberalism so I really hope that without making too many artificial connections we are going to make some really intriguing connections between the ancient world and the politics of today so what we want to think about is, is, is populism a useful lens through which to consider the first century uh, CE uh, Roman Emperor Nero? Can we learn anything fresh about Nero by thinking about him as a populist? Um, and in fact, can we, can we learn anything about our own times um, since we live in a populist moment politically with populist politicians and movements? Uh, on the rise around the world, uh, have been for a few years now, from Trump to Podemos to Johnson to Corbyn. Um, these figures and movements have recently loomed large in our contemporary politics. So I think in considering the question of Nero and populism, we have to acknowledge that we're dealing with several layers of understanding. On the one hand, we have the kind of received Nero from the ancient historians Tacitus and Suetonius. Nero the dissolute, Nero the megalomaniac, the murderous, and of course this 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 uh, Nero um, as as brought down to us from these sources has been magnified and made more and more lurid as the centuries go on. Nero the killer of Christians, Nero the the fiddler while Rome burns. Um, then there's I suppose another that uh, arguably or the potentially re irrecoverable real Nero um, that lurks behind those sources and perhaps. You know, this is where the material culture that we see in the exhibition comes in, um, particularly maybe offering perhaps um, a different view. And finally, of course, I think uh, we shouldn't be blind to the final layer of the reason it's very tempting to frame Nero as a populist is now is to do with our own particular moment. We wouldn't necessarily have been framing Nero as a populist or thinking about populism in relation to Nero 20, 30 or 40 years ago. So 
there's a really a lot to consider here and I'm very excited to ask our panel to start thinking about these questions but the first thing I want to do is to ask Tom who's written so brilliantly about the lives of the Judeo Claudian emperors to kick off by giving us the story I mean in a way the kind of unexpurgated lurid brilliant kind of um, story of, of the Emperor Nero, just so that we can be reminded of what we're dealing with here, Tom. But, so, so Joe, the, the subtitle of this show is The Man Behind the Myth, and I'm going to give you the myth. So the myth is, uh, Nero is born to two monstrous parents. The, the father is from a distinguished uh, aristocratic family, the Domitii. He is the kind of guy who runs over a small child in his chariot and thinks absolutely nothing of it. Um, his wife, Agrippina, is descended from Augustus, but more saliently is the sister of the Emperor Caligula, who, of course, is uh, another byword for depravity. When Nero is born, his father looks at the baby and says that no good can come of any child born of me and Agrippina. And so it proves. Um, Agrippina ends up married to her uncle, Claudius, uh, who has an, a younger son, a son who is younger than Nero. Uh, Agrippina is keen to get this boy out of the way and Claudius, so she poisons Claudius. Uh, Nero becomes emperor shortly after he gets rid of uh, the Claudius's son, Britannicus. Um, he is then tutored by, uh, essentially he's under the thumb of Agrippina, who is an absolutely terrifying virago. Um, he is uh, tutored by Seneca, uh, the great philosopher, and for about five years, he's essentially kept in check. Uh, he's, he's kind of teenager when he, late teens when he becomes emperor, into his early 20s. Then he decides he's had enough of it. Um, he essentially kind of slightly elbows Seneca aside, and he has um, Agrippina murdered. Um, he does this in a variety, he, he essentially kind of um, wacky races type, kind of contraptions. First of all, he tries to uh, destroy her in a room that collapses. That doesn't work. Then he tries to drown her on a ship that collapses. That doesn't work. So he sends a death squad and they stab her through her womb after she has pointed to it and said, stab this that gave birth to such a monster. From this point on, uh, there's nothing to hold him back. He takes to the stage, absolutely shocking in a society where actors are viewed as absolutely the lowest of the low. Um, he uh, performs on the lyre. He uh, then decides that he'd like to burn down Rome so that he can build himself an enormous palace in the middle of the city. Um, having done that, uh, he then crushes uh, a conspiracy against him in which Seneca had been involved. He orders Seneca to commit suicide. Simultaneously, um, he, I, I forgot to mention furthermore that um, he'd been married to Claudius's daughter. Uh, he has got rid of her, had her executed, and replaced her with the great love of his life, Papaea Sabina, who is the most beautiful woman in Rome, shocking, scandalous, says, um, hope I die before I get old. She does die before she gets old because Nero kicks her to death after she, heavily pregnant, nags him when he's come back late from the races. He is distraught by this, so he does the obvious thing. What would you do if you're missing uh, the wife that you just kicked to death? Obviously, you look around for someone to replace her who looks exactly like her. Nero finds it in the shape not of a girl, but of a boy uh, who he castrates and then nicknamed Sporus, Greek for sperm. It's a kind of amusing joke. But aside from that, Sporus becomes Papaea Sabina. Nero then takes Papaea Sabina, stroke Sporus, with him to Greece, where he competes in the Olympics. It's all completely rigged. He wins first prize despite having crashed his chariot. He comes back. By this point, everyone's fed up with him. There's a rebellion. Uh, Nero loses his support. He runs away to a villa. There he gets cornered. He says, what an artist dies with me, and he commits suicide. That was absolutely brilliant, Tom. Thank you very much indeed. So that, as you say, that's the myth. Before Catherine comes in, can I just say that is the myth? Yeah. <laughs> but actually, first, I kind of want to ask. Ooh, can, um, I, can I just, Charlie? Just, also, just, just, just to add, I missed out a crucial aspect of his his subsequent notoriety in the myth, which is that he blames the great fire uh, of Rome on the Christians, and. 
he will be commemorated in the book of Revelation faithfully as the beast, the number of the beast, according to uh, numeric calculations, comes to, to mean Nero. And so um, Nero's reputation derives from uh, Roman writers who have every reason to mistrust him and Christian writers who likewise commemorate him as this kind of almost literally demonic figure. He is the emperor who presides over Babylon, which is Rome. It's, it's a remarkable story and it's, of course, we love it. We love it and it's really hard to detach ourselves from this kind of, this, the sheer appallingness of this narrative. But I think the second building brick, and, and I think we're gonna connect everything up when Catherine comes in in a minute, but the second building brick, I think, for me is, is, is really to get a handle on, you know, what populism actually is, because it feels to me like there are, there are a lot of different populisms, um, uh, in our contemporary politics, uh, some just really don't look like others. There are, there are the sort of populisms of the left, there are populisms of the right, there are nationalist populisms. And I would love you, Will, to kind of help us with that. Sure. Um, I, I mean, it's a, it is a term that is um, quite confusing. It's around a lot at the moment. And I think one of the immediate um, ambivalences of the term is that it gets used both to um, denounce people as undemocratic when they're accused of being um, kind of proto-fascist or, or this sort of thing, but at the same time it also makes this kind of rhetorical appeal to uh, the people and to moments of, of democratic uprising. So it's, it's unclear often exactly where populism stands in relation to uh, democracy as we understand it in the modern world. Um, I think there's a textbook definition of populism, which is that it is a style of rhetoric more than anything else, uh, but also I suppose a style of leadership, which makes moral distinctions between a group of people who are perceived as morally pure and ordinary and, uh, and, and, and decent, and they are the people in some sense. So whenever you hear someone like Nigel Farage talking about sort of the people, good, ordinary people, he's got a certain kind of type of person in mind. I mean, there's millions of them, but there's a certain sort of image of who the people are. And they are distinguished from a second group who are known as the elite. And this is obviously a, a kind of a modern um, vocabulary, but this uh, rhetorical move of drawing this moral line between those who are ordinary and morally pure on the one side and those who are uh, elite and corrupt on the other side is the kind of central characteristic of all populisms within the, 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 the analysis of, of political science and political theory. Um, there are, as you, as, you, as you suggested, left-wing versions of this uh, rhetorical move, so that if, for instance, Jeremy Corbyn or uh, uh, Podemos or Bernie Sanders says that the 1% have rigged the economy against kind of ordinary people, that is a kind of left populist movement as a move because it's drawing this rhetorical and, and moralized distinction. It's not simply saying, you know, like Marxists do, that you know, capitalism is sort of structurally organized around exploitation. It's actually saying that one small group has actually ripped off the much larger group. Uh, equally, and I suppose more prevalently at the moment, there is a, a, a right-wing populism, and often when people use the term populism, they're talking about the right and they're talking about nationalists, where the, it's very often, the elite is very often distinguished as, as, as a cultural elite, um, and that they're, crime, their, their sort of moral um, um, deviance is to be disloyal on a, in cultural terms to the nation. And, and that cultural elite may involve um, judges, um, it may involve uh, academics, it may involve now in the, in the kind of culture wars around museums, curators, or there are all sorts of people that might be sort of lumped into this elite, but their distinguishing characteristic from the right is that they uh, exhibit disloyalty to, 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 to the ordinary people who make up the nation. So it's that, that dividing line between um, these two groups that is so key. I just want to like identify just a couple of other things if I can, in case this is helpful. I think um, one thing to say is that, um, uh, first of all, of course, you can think of combinations of these of, of left and right, and, and, we, and there are various examples of that in, in, in Europe, uh, in various countries at the moment. But I think that one thing which I, and I think from, this may be relevant to, to some how we come back to the, the, the topic of um, Nero and perhaps in his relationships to the Senate, is that 
what this tends to, to involve in, not just in, in, in democratic societies, but, but in constitutionally organized polities more generally, is a, a type of leader who stands up and targets the rest of the political system in some sense. So that you might, you know, around something like, you know, um, particularly Brexit did this heavily to the United Kingdom, where effectively those who were positioning themselves as the defenders of Brexit and the kind of saviors of Brexit were blaming the House of Commons as being the enemy, the those who betrayed Brexit. There was Boris Johnson used that phrase that was very, very controversial, the surrender bill, that uh, he, he, he kept using it as being this, this, this claim that the MPs did not represent the people and that he did represent the people. And it's that claim that on some level, the institutions which, which purport to act in the public good, which might be parliament, it might be law, it might be the Senate, it might be all sorts of institutions that purport to act in public good are actually lying to you, that they are fake in some sense. This is obviously something that Trump accused CNN and the New York Times of being fake news media that they are uh, that they are acting in their own interests meanwhile i as the great leader um, have some kind of direct relationship to this morally pure people and that through my body through my performances through my uh, self uh, can can act in the interests of the people in a way that all of these sort of constitutionally and legally sort of mandated procedures are actually just a kind of uh, sort of rigged game that uh, that are sort of cheating the people of, 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 of the inheritance that is that is naturally theirs and and that then leads to, to, to and this is my final point I mean that, that then poses the question who is qualified to be such a leader because there's an immediate paradox where on the one hand they have to position themselves as a kind of outsider where they have to be able to say you know I'm not part of that elite I'm not part of that sort of internal system of people looking after themselves all the kind of you know liberals and the, the you know the, the, all of these, these sort of lawyers and, and parliamentarians um, and on the other hand, they obviously have to have quite a lot of power and quite a lot of recognition in order to be able to do this at all. And this is why I think the very concept of celebrity becomes very interesting, because figures who have celebrity, whether as business people like Donald Trump, uh, whether as um, people who have a sort of face that is known via the television for some reason, but, you know, I, I, we haven't got on to the beyond the myth yet in relation to Nero, but it's interesting that as Tom was talking about a politician who takes to the stage, because of course it's it's in the arts, it's in the cultural industries, it's in the media, which offers the opportunity for someone to both sort of square that circle on the one hand of being able to position themselves as an outsider to the political system, but on the other hand to attain sufficient recognition and power that they're able to somehow kind of, um, as I say, kind of walk that rather paradoxical line. Of course, and, and of course, Trump was, aside from being a famous businessman, was of course the star of reality. Exactly, it was a reality TV show, and I think in some ways, reality television is is is, is the sort of perfect um, sort of space for this type of uh, political performance in the current world. Obviously, yeah, fascinating, Catherine. I I I just want. I'm just going to quote from the introduction to the um, exhibition catalogue, Torsten Opper's brilliant introduction to the, the Nero exhibition catalogue. And he talks about, essentially, he describes what the, 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 the account that Tom has just sort of praised beautifully for us, which, which was a sort of a Tacitean, Suetonian account um, of Nero. He says, this myth, um, was very deliberately and artfully created by a group of elite Roman writers already in the half century or so after Nero's death through enforced suicide in June AD 68. And it has been accepted almost unchallenged until relatively recently. So, you know, with, you know, the, Catherine, can you speak to, can you give us a sense um, here of how far I mean, in a sense, you agree with that. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's the account that Tom has given us the sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the ancient equivalent of Guardian and FT leader writers railing against Johnson and being the only thing that's left. <laughs> I mean, is that, is, is, is that the, um, the anti-populate, anti-Neronian um, point of view? Uh, uh, completely kind of uh, abstracted from reality? Is it just a sort of smear job by uh, Nero's elite uh, uh, opponents? Or how would you characterise that so-called myth? Well, I think 
in, in some respects, it obviously is a smear job. And one thing that's really important to remember about Nero is that, as Tom has vividly described, he, um, he, he comes to a horrible end. He's the last member of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. So the people who come after him want to distance themselves as radically as possible from Nero. So, uh, you know, whereas previous emperors had been succeeded by other members of their own family, who had a vested interest in in, in kind of their um, legitimacy, Nero, by contrast, is succeeded by people who who want to diss him absolutely. So, um, and we get you know a very strong um, flavour of that. I mean, the, the Flavian emperors who eventually emerge victorious in the form of Vespasian after all the civil wars of, of the year sixty eight. Um, they they're clearly you know very focused on portraying Nero as completely um, beyond the pale, because actually their claim to, you know, Vespasian's claim to being emperor is extremely flimsy. He's he's just won in a civil war. He's got no family connection with Augustus. So, you know, his, his best chance is to bang on about how terrible Nero was and how he himself um, embodies traditional old-fashioned Roman values and particularly old-fashioned uh, Roman military values. Vespasian's a terribly successful general. Um, now, in fact, the Flavians do all kinds of rather populist things, but um, but they they they're kind of you know they've clearly got uh, um, every reason to portray Nero as uh, in as in as bad a light as possible. And I mean, you know, so and that Flavian tradition is manifest clearly in Suetonius's biography in Tacitus's account of the period, um, and also in things like Marshall's um, epigrams written under the flavors. You might come back to, to some of those later. So yes, obviously, there is a sort of massive smear job going on. And it's also the case that, you know, even if perhaps Nero hadn't been kind of succeeded by um, a completely different lot of emperors, um, he might have had a fairly poor reputation uh, amongst the, the Roman elite because there are clearly a lot of things he does which are quite unpopular with those who see themselves as being very attached to the Senate, like Tacitus in particular, and also Cassius Dio, who's um, another Roman senator writing his history in the third century. Um, so the Senate is, clearly there's a strong tradition of senatorial hostility to Nero. There's also some evidence that Nero was very popular with the Roman people or some Roman people and even Tacitus concedes that um, you know when Nero died there were some some people you know skipped around the streets wearing caps of liberty celebrating their new freedom but the very lowest of the low the worst people in Rome were devastated when Nero died according to Tacitus um, and, and we can easily see that as a, as a sort of uh, warped representation of the fact that Nero did have a connection with the Roman people that you know all the all the games he put on which are catalogued in great detail particularly by Suetonius he's very very interested in in games of all kinds um that, that you know those were very popular I mean at the same time I think we we need to um bear in mind that what um in some ways saying that someone is popular with the Roman people is itself um a, a, a form of criticism if it comes from from Tacitus. Uh, so, you know, it's not necessarily a, a, a positive to say that Nero is popular with the people. Um, if we think about the material evidence, and we, there's some really interesting things in, in the exhibition, there's, you know, graffiti from Pompeii where Nero does seem to have uh, had quite a positive reception, and we could connect that with the fact that Papaya, um, whom Tom mentioned earlier, her, her family came from around Pompeii. Um, there's a sort of wonderful graffito that celebrates um, Nero and Papaya coming to the Temple of Venus in Pompeii and bringing lavish gifts, and, and that seems, you know, that's that's described in in very positive terms. Um, so, you know, a sort of connection with. Um, uh, a sort of celebration of of, of Nero, um, but I think you know if we if we want to to think about this in a, in a different way, and I and I'd like to come back to some of the points that that Will raised. We could think about how what we could see Nero doing is um, actually exploring quite a different way of being an emperor from say the way that Augustus did. So um, Nero is exploring. Uh, 
a, a way of being a Roman emperor that isn't like being first among equals, living a conspicuously modest life, um, you know, doing lots of public works, although actually Nero does do quite a lot of public works in terms of, of rebuilding the city after the fire and so on, and um, building a marketplace, you know, doing works, improving the harbour at Ostia to improve the corn supply, all those sorts of things that, um, you know, other emperors too, um, uh, do to that, that kind of clearly it, it could be seen as improving the quality of life for people. But he's there's there's a sense in which the way Nero uh, presents himself is a, is a kind of deliberate rejection of the kind of traditional Roman senatorial model of the, the, the sort of um, political man who is a, a, someone who achieves great military victories. Nero is conspicuously not interested in, in expanding the empire. He's not interested in talking to the army. It might strain his voice and prevent him from singing. Um, but there's, there's also this sort of Nero which, who wants to um, be flamboyant and you know, build himself a magnificent house. And when he builds his golden house, according to Suetonius, he says, at last I can live like a human being. And I think that's kind of an interesting moment where we can see the idea of the emperor as the figure who can indulge his appetites in, in a way that anybody might want to do, but he's got the resources to do it. So there's a sort of sense there of, of a kind of, and this perhaps goes back to, the, you know, someone who shares the tastes of the ordinary people who, who might themselves want to do that sort of thing and not follow the stuffy old Senate and their kind of boring culture of discipline and um, you know, old fashioned morality, but actually have some fun, have parties, have lavish dinners, you know, really indulge yourself. And, and that's a, that, so that's a kind of model. And it's of course impossible to know how far Nero was pursuing that in a sort of self-conscious way. But we could nevertheless, I think it's quite interesting to think about that as, as a sort of model of imperial power, which is really radically different from the, the sort of Augustus model, which you know, at the beginning of his reign, he claimed he wanted to follow, but that was no doubt Seneca breathing down his neck. So the shades of Berlusconi though, are these, or, or perhaps the other way around. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, it's kind of shades of Nero with his lavish parties. But um, so, OK, so one thing that interests me, what I'd like to find out is what are the people to Nero? So if if, if Nero was currying favour with the people, um, why was that in this particular Roman system? Why was that necessary or useful for him? I mean, it's not like he was living in a democracy that he had to manipulate in, in the way perhaps that uh, we might see in populist democratic regimes of the present. Well, uh, I mean, you could answer that, or Tom, I, in a demo. Catherine, go, because you, 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 were, you were on the roll. Okay, I, I suppose, I mean, I think this is where the games are enormously important because, you know, the culture of games in, in Rome is um, very... Uh, kind of much at the heart of political life under the Principate, that you have these, these kind of extended um, sequences of games, whether they're kind of, you know, fights in the amphitheater, whether they're races in the circus or, you know, plays in the theater, where the Roman people go to be part of a big group and a big group that kind of sees its emperor and where the emperor interacts directly with the audience. And that's, I think, very important. Um, and there's a, there's a sort of nice moment in Suetonius where he says, Nero hated anybody else he thought was popular with the people. There's a sort of sense that, you know, he wants that to be an exclusive relationship. The people should love him. He's the provider of these wonderful games um, and he wants the love from from the audience that he gets when he when he goes to the games and and that that's a that's a sort of very validating thing for him um and and but it's not is it constitutionally important for them to be on side at this point in roman history or if they have do, do the plebs the people have political power because it also seems to me this is a very it feels like a very roman specifically i'm talking about the city of rome phenomenon the the, the empire is enormous so um, why is he bothering with this uh, kind of small group of people in Rome? Why is that important? Well, I mean, in a way, the constitution is sort of irrelevant in some ways. I mean, in theory, you know, the Senate and people of Rome are sovereign, um, uh, but the emperor has, 
you know, the, the, the power over the Roman army. And that's kind of really the basis of his, of his power, essentially. Um, so you could say that, you know, remaining popular with the troops is, is what's really crucial, but he doesn't have much interaction with them, or it's all kind of, you know, yes, there, there's the Praetorian Guard in Rome, and, um, but, you know, most of the legions are, are, are far away, and, and, and so his, his relationship with them is, is kind of a highly mediated one. But, um, but the people of Rome are kind of, you know, very, very much kind of there, and I think it, it is that sort of sense of, um, I mean, and this is where Nero is a showman, Nero is a sort of celebrity, that sort of sense of, of kind of needing the, the, the kind of, you know, needing all those likes. I mean, he, he kind of really needs that affirmation that, um, that the people love him. He's got his paid um, claque who, who kind of sit in the audience and, and kind of do, uh, you know, initiate the applause when he performs. But that's, that's a kind of, um, it's, it's not, it's not in, a, in a sense something that, that he, he's not going out there wanting people to vote for him in, in, in an election. It's, it's kind of a more immediate sense of, of kind of support. I wonder, Will, if this is ringing any contemporary bells, because it, it's enormously tempting to make, to, to, to be incredibly unsophisticated about this and say, you know, well, you know, Trump is the Nero of the 21st. Well, I mean, there, there, are, some, there are some pretty obvious um, connections, which I'm sure many, many in the audience have already spotted a few of them. I mean, um, I mean, Trump obviously was obsessed with his crowds. We know that. And he was you know, fixated. He spent the his first month in office still talking about how big his inauguration crowd was. Um, he went on he went on rallies when he had no need to because he loved the crowds. Um, every time he got sort of depressed by the fact that he had to try and govern the the, 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 com the country and run the White House, they would take him off on a to a to a rally in Florida or something to try and sort of cheer him up because that's what he felt uh, was was good. It made him feel good, and you know, and he and he said these. Um, you know, he used the language of love. He said, he had famously said on the 2016, 2016 um, uh, uh, trail, he said, uh, you know, you know, attacking the Democrats for being a bunch of sort of pointy headed liberals on the East Coast. He said, I love, I love the poorly educated, he said. I love you people, you're poorly educated. I love the poorly educated. And and that was seen as a very sort of positive, rather sort of curious kind of compliment. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that sort of um, sense of needing that great kind of intimacy. I mean, this is not, I mean, various um, sort of social theorists and and, and psychoanalysts and um, sociologists have written about this a lot in the 20th century, particularly in relation to fascism. Uh, many uh, figures in the Frankfurt School were particularly alarmed by this this capacity to create a sort of um, psychic intimacy between leader and, and crowd on a via you know from a platform. So this is a this has long been seen as a kind of um, uh, uh, particularly in the modern era as, as something very dangerous and, and Napoleon would be the other kind of key kind of modern reference point in all of this. Um, the other thing which I think is is worth highlighting just when we're talking about Trump is, is, is the lurking danger in all of this because the ultimate, I mean Trump began in office um, obsessed with the size of the inauguration crowd, he left office with a crowd storming the Capitol building, uh, literally seeking to uh, murder Mike Pence and, and possibly other people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and, and so on. So there were, you know, the, the, the crowd turned into a force of, of, of genuine violent threat and, and murderous threat, um, and he, he encouraged that. And, and he still has this extraordinary stranglehold over the Republican Party um, via that sort of uh, strange um, sort of emotional and, 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 and a cultural relationship that he, he still um, managed to sustain where certain people considered him to be um, kind of on some level pure, well maybe not pure because he's kind of, his, his, his moral flaws are all on the outside, but on some sense there's a kind of an honesty about his sort of uh, sheer kind of awfulness I suppose in a way that is considered not to be true of the kind of you know inside of professional politicians and so on. I mean Tom, it, it's a kind of, in a way it always seems quite a sort of curious relationship that why why would the people, as it were, be attracted to, um, you know, any, someone who shows, he displays enormous wealth and splendor and uh, richness beyond their every uh, dream, while at the same time deprecating this other so-called elite, you know, all these. But well, I, I, think, I think the answer lies in the fact that um, before Rome becomes an autocracy. It was a republic, and it's it's that status that Rome had as a republic, of course, that um, 
joins it perhaps to the United States, which likewise you know, establishes itself as a republic very much on the, on the model of Rome. And in, in the, 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 the Roman Republic, um, I mean, Will said that, that populism is really a style of rhetoric and politics in the Roman Republic was not really about kind of issues. It wasn't arguments over, you know, tax or whatever. It, it was really about style. It was about the way that you promoted yourself. Um, and very reductively, you could say that there were kind of two approaches to this. There was one that was embodied by people who called themselves the optimates, the best, or the boni, the good guys, which gives you a sense of the tradition that they're coming from. And these are people who identify with the traditional virtues, the traditional values, rugged, upstanding, um, some, sometimes kind of rebarbatively moral. Uh, in their in in their kind of public stance, the way that they promote themselves and project themselves, and then you have figures who are called populares, and populists may not you know it's not a a, a bad translation of them, and these are guys who are just as rich, just as aristocratic, just as well bred as as the boni, but who um, make it very public that they share the interests and the passions of the people. So rather like Berlusconi buying a football team, Julius Caesar, who is the kind of archetype of the popularis, uh, lavishes money on buying silver armor for gladiators. And it's important that the popularis shows that he cares about the people because he, he identifies with them and he enjoys their pleasures. And what Augustus did, does, his genius is really to fuse those two traditions. So he, he, he promotes himself as, you know, he's, he's, he's a senator, he's, he's a magistrate, he uh, claims to have restored the, the kind of the ancestral traditions of the Roman people and the Republican system of government, while at the same time, uh, I mean, you know, he, Julius Caesar, when he was at the, the amphitheater, actually, despite the fact that he laid on gladiators, um, he would make a point of doing his correspondence so people could see that he wasn't particularly interested. Augustus, he's absolutely sharing the passion. It's kind of like Tony Blair, practicing headers with Kevin Keegan. He's letting people know that he, he's interested in, in this. And essentially what happens over the course of the, um, the, the succession, the, the various members of the Julian and Claudian families that succeed Augustus is that they go either one way. So Tiberius, he, he's very much a kind of optimate. He's, he's very much, um, he, he despises the people. He's notorious for never putting on any, any games uh, and therefore he's disliked. Um, Caligula goes absolutely to the opposite extreme. I mean, he lives, he lives fast. He, 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 the Senate absolutely hate him, but the people think he's, you know, he's rather cool. Claudius again veers back to the kind of optimate tradition and Nero kind of absolutely goes full blown popularis. Now, why does this matter to America? I think it's more than just tangential. Uh, I, I think it's, or, or indeed tendentious, because America likewise has this foundational myth in which the founding fathers are rugged, they're farmers, they're soldiers, you know, they're born to the plow, all this kind of stuff. And even though obviously over the two centuries that have followed the American Revolution, America's become a completely different society, that kind of primal myth of uh, American statesmen who are soldiers, who are, who are principled, who will sacrifice themselves for other people, still has tremendous currency. And the guy, I think, who absolutely exemplified that was John McCain, who Trump notoriously mocked as a loser because he'd been caught when he, uh, you know, when his plane crashed. Uh, and he'd been tortured and, uh, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd rather than kind of, he, you know, accept an offer from the Viet Cong to go back early because he was the, the son of an important figure in America. He refused that. that. I mean, that's like something out of the early pages of Livy. And so McCain was respected for that. And so when, when McCain died, there was the, the, the remarkable spectacle of Democrats and Republicans, all the presidents gathering for the funeral. And Trump very, very ostentatiously was not invited. And you have McCain's daughter standing up and essentially saying that the Republican and Democrat presidents who were there were the embodiment of the Republic and that Trump was somehow a kind of intruder. He was a kind of a vulgar charlatan. And um, Catherine would say better than me because she's written the definitive book on the way that, that, that Romans exploited funerals. But that seemed to me a very, very Roman moment, using the funeral of this very public figure to kind of lambast Trump. And I think the reason why there are echoes, as I said, 
of Rome. I mean, it's not, it, it, it's because the founding fathers modeled themselves on this kind of I, ideal of the early Republic, and it's still kind of a shadow. So I do think it works better with America than perhaps it does, say, with, with Britain or, or other countries like that. Yeah, that, that, that's so interesting and, and, and completely brilliant. Thank you, Tom. The, but no, nevertheless, is there, will, is there a kind of populist leaders toolkit, you know, big public, popular public works tick, you know, kind of? Well, I mean, you know, obviously, yeah, I, I don't know if there's a toolkit. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think clearly the media is now the sort of central tool. Um, and um, I mean, there's, it's interesting, actually, um, this issue of you know the, the 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 things like the graffiti that was mentioned earlier in relation to to, to Nero. I mean, I mean, th there's a theory that Trump kind of his his presidential um, you know because everyone thought of course it was, this is impossible. This is never going to happen. He's never going to become president. And yet, actually, kind of online meme culture played a very important role early on in terms of people sort of creating these kind of Trump memes that began to circulate initially around kind of outright message boards. And there was a sort of you know uh, what what you know, some social scientists study what they call fandom, which is a little bit like being a kind of football fan in a way where people just sort of, you know, just want to associate themselves with a kind of a brand in a way. So there's a kind of a, a branding issue. I think, you know, you could say, I don't know if Johnson fits the populist type very well, but nevertheless, the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the blonde mop of hair and the name Boris and the, the sort of, there's a kind of a, a recognisable brand that you can get behind without knowing the first thing about any of his policies. And I think that's, being able to kind of mobilize something like that is is is, is a very important part of the the toolkit such that you can become um something that can invite um followers because ultimately that's the that, that i mean and when i say, I, think, I think it's interesting actually the, the term follower is it means all these things on social media today uh, but i think when you think of what a follower implies it implies motion um which is that I'm going to get you somewhere. You, if you follow me, don't worry if I'm telling the truth or lying or you know, whether I'm doing good things or bad things. If you follow me, we're going to get to some destination that we all share. Uh, and that's the sort of, I think, when, often when I think about you know, the distinction between um, the conventional politicians, uh, they don't necessarily kind of promise to kind of take people anywhere. Uh, they they promise perhaps to serve the people or promote the public interest or these slightly more kind of static concepts of trying to sort of reflect back to people what they want in some way. Um, whereas the notion of the kind of disruptor and of the, the leader who has followers is that they're going to kind of break through this sort of thing and end up somewhere else somewhere else altogether. Catherine, is, is, can you connect that trope or mode to Nero or do you think that's that's just not really what's going on I mean is Nero promising to take I mean is he promising something or is his is his main aim just to kind of stay alive and keep in power and have fun I think the having fun is is, is actually very important um but the I suppose I mean, to, to go back to one of the things that Tom was talking about, I mean, that the popularis politicians, one of the things we have to remember is that that's, that's always an insult to call someone a popularis. No one ever says, I'm a popularis. It's, it's always kind of what you call your political opponents when, because they're, they're kind of, you know, courting the support of the, of the mob. Um, but of course, you know, from our perspective, we can say, well, you know, someone like Clodius in the 50s BCE is the, perhaps the most notorious of the popularis. He was someone who actually realised that the common people of Rome were completely desperate and really needed a, a better food supply and you know and he and he kind of gave them that and that made him it brought him an enormous popular following so you know he's taken them to to kind of food security um fairly um which we would see as a, as a kind of fairly basic need rather than a, a kind of frivolous populist um indulgence that the uh, with nero it's not at all clear that he's particularly concerned with the the kind of you know the 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 comfort and and um safety of the people of rome um not even with his building projects catherine because that's a sort of defense isn't it of nero yeah. in, in a sense you know i think there is a there is a, a a kind of stream in the in the brilliant exhibition that is a kind of defense of of nero um it's not the full revisionism but there's a kind of there's an invitation to look at as an alternative view and the, one of the alternative views that we're invited to consider is that 
A, Nero was in no way responsible for the fire, the burning of Rome, but B, um, he took some care to rebuild, you know, after this awful Grenfell times 50 catastrophe, um, took care to um, uh, institute better building regulations and build back uh, better, I suppose. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I mean, you, you can tell that story in relation to the tiny fragments of of, um, of information that we have about, you know, what Nero built and taken from coins as much as from the, the sort of handful of references in, in Suetonius and, and Tacitus. Um, so, yes, I mean, you, you could make that claim, but um, the sources are very much not interested in making that claim, and the, the kind of the kind of populism that they attribute to Nero is much more, um, not so much um, wanting to please the people as, although he he kind of you know laps up that sense of being appreciated, but somehow um, pursuing his appetites in a way that is kind of characteristic of sort of lower um, lower mortals. So so it's a sort of it's that kind of um, the, the pursuit of license, if you like, is that licentiousness, which is seen as, as a kind of, you know, what, um, what, all, what uh, the, the, the plebeian Romans would do if, if, if they could kind of thing, rather than um, sticking with the, the, um, the, the kind of boring self-discipline that someone like Seneca is, is constantly trying to inculcate in his, in his pupil. So it's, I suppose this is kind of to go back to the idea of Nero as a kind of um, capturing people's imaginations by kind of indulging himself in an incredibly sort of um, inventive way, if you like, and Tom, touched earlier on some of the extremely inventive ways uh, of uh, kinds of self-indulgence that were attributed to Nero. So it's that it's that sort of um, that, that sense of of a kind of a, a sort of freedom, if you like, um, that is meant to be is meant to have an appeal um, to those whose lives are unbelievably constricted. But there's another resonance that you, you you made me consider another resonance really that i think the idea of, of framing yourself as doing what any ordinary person would want to but just in a kind of staggeringly kind of rich and over the top way isn't that a bit like kind of trump uh, trump kind of living in a sort of ludicrous gold tax palace but also eating burgers and, and kind of really self-consciously really self-consciously doing that I think there's, there's definitely, I mean, something which has been spotted in kind of voting behaviour all over um, well, in the United States, but also in the UK. I mean, there's a sort of uh, a real problem that particularly kind of centre liberal left parties have, which is that a lot of um, uh, a lot of voters uh, from uh, more traditional working class backgrounds feel that they are looked down upon by those with certain qualifications, living in certain locales, university towns, metropolitan cities, and so on. Uh, and that actually people um, might often feel more insulted by someone feeling that they are kind of um, culturally superior to them on the grounds of education and so on, than they do by someone who is manifestly financially superior to them. That actually, you know, someone who's financially superior can still be in touch with people because they're not claiming to be uh, culturally superior. Um, not, I'm not saying that that's necessarily an, an accurate representation of how um, kind of you know the liberal elites actually behave. It might be in certain instances, but I think that there is uh, th there's clearly been a, um, a sense that someone like Trump um, embodies in, in, in various ways that actually, yeah, if I had that much money, I would do that. I would do the same thing. I mean, there's a there's a very famous um, ethnography of Tea Party supporters. Actually, it's just pre-Trump by um, a, an American sociologist called Arlie Russell Hochschild where she, she spends five years living with these Tea Party supporters in Louisiana. Um, and she's sort of wondering why they're not more angry with, with, with BP, the, the oil company, uh, for, um, uh, for, um, uh, for the fact that the um, oil spills in the Gulf had done various damage to the fishing industry and so on. And their response was, 
um, well, actually, you know, they're a company. They're trying to make profits. That we would, we, we're trying to make profits as well. We can sort of identify, even with this very large corporation, they can sort of identify with with a logic of sort of profit maximization more than with a logic of kind of you know sort of welfare implementation and what they perceive as being the kind of the interests of the sort of northeastern elite, the liberal elite, who oh they want to come down here and fix all our problems. They don't know anything about our problems. Why do they think they're they're on my side? They know nothing about me, and so on. Whereas there's a kind of a, a sort of basic um, sort of economic commonality between even the super rich and the person who's simply trying to get by, which I think is has has played out in in democracy in, in various uh, ways over the last uh, ten years. I think in, in in quite manifest ways. You know, and Berlusconi has been mentioned already. In another example. Uh, where effectively a sort of you know a celebrity culture mixed with a, a certain kind of bling culture, I suppose, uh, can have this sort of a um, so-called kind of populist dimension because uh, monetary gain is something that arguably everybody can relate to in a way that um, you know pursuing some kind of um, whatever it might be, you know, the, the sort of language of sort of economics or, or, or social reform can seem rather kind of esoteric and, and distant in some way. I mean, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, Trump is a showman. I mean, that, that's kind of key to his appeal, I think. I think it, it, one of the things that always struck me as, as kind of very revealing about him was his fascination with wrestling, which is kind of absolutely on the cusp between being an authentic sport and yet completely staged. And there's a kind of amazing sequence where he he wrestles with the, the president of the World Wrestling Federation and wins and then kind of shaves him on TV. And in a sense, his you know, the role that he plays in The Apprentice and then the role that he plays as president of the United States is a kind of similar, you know, he's 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 kind of play acting. He's kind of playing the role that, that maybe people would dream of doing, of, of presenting a television series, of, of being the president of the United States. It's all showmanship. And in a sense, I think the same is true of Nero, except what I would say, for, for, you know, on behalf of Nero, slightly sticking up for him, is that I think that, that he must have had an order of talent um, to hold a stage or to uh, race a chariot at the Olympics, because the the stereotype, the myth that I articulated is that this is all kind of comic. He's he's hopeless. He's terrible. But actually, I mean, it's it's the equivalent of headlining at Glastonbury or uh, racing in you know Formula One or something. I mean, it it takes risk. And the thing about being an emperor going to say to a, you know a, a gladiatorial show is that you are kind of risking being booed. I mean, I can't think of a, a similar autocratic system. It, really anywhere in the world where a, a figure like a Caesar subjects himself to a kind of public display of approval or disapproval. So you have to be fairly confident that the crowd isn't just going to laugh at you and, and, and kind of pelt you off the stage. So I suspect that, that Nero was probably better at, um, at gigging than he might have the rep subsequent reputation for. And, you know, to, to race in the Olympics, I mean, he, he has far more horses than the average uh, contender in the Olympics racing a chariot has. It's incredibly dangerous. And so in a sense, to be thrown and then get back into uh, in, in, into a chariot is like crashing a Formula One car and then getting back into it. So again, kind of respect to him. And when, when Nero dies, uh, you know, that you have this, this year of the four emperors that, that Catherine mentioned. So two of them, Galba and, and Vespasian, who ultimately uh, emerges as the emperor, they are playing the kind of the rugged soldier, the uh, you know stern disciplinarian. But there are two others, Otho and Vitellius, both of whom consciously kind of echo the Neronian role. And I think that if either one of them had survived as emperor, um, we might well have a very different perspective on Nero, because I think that there is something there in 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 the atmosphere, in the political atmosphere, that is still politically potent even a year after Nero's suicide? Well, this is very interesting. I just want to, um, at this point, put out a quick reminder to um, those who are with us online watching, um, do do keep sending in your questions because we will certainly be turning to them um, pretty soon. And um, I'm looking forward to, to kind of getting, getting, getting the panel to get to grips with them. But Catherine, I want to bring you in because you were looking wonderfully skeptical whilst Tom was speaking. And I, I, th I think you may have something to say. Thank you, Charlotte. Yes. I mean, in a way, you're right, Tom. But I mean, clearly, Nero devoted a huge amount of energy to his um, interest in, in chariot racing and his singing. And Spatoni talks about how incredibly 
uh, carefully he practiced he did all these exercises to improve his voice although his voice still wasn't very good um but i think we need to bear in mind that if you there perhaps is an element of risk when you when you perform in front of an audience, but maybe the risk is somewhat diminished when your soldiers are physically present in um, in the performance space. Um, and there are stories about how people weren't allowed to leave, no matter what their excuse. Women, you know, about to give birth, but not allowed to leave because Nero is performing. So, you know, at, at least according to the the, the accounts we have, um, the audience response is very much kind of controlled. Um, and and again, you know, sort of inducing. Um, members of the elite to participate in his shows. I mean, we could read that as, you know, they were all really happy to do it. But as Tasta says, you know, the, the money of someone who, who can force you to do something is in itself persuasive. So, you know, he's got the sort of backup, the military backup to get everyone, you know, perhaps d disposed to, to, to be appreciative of, um, of his efforts. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to bring in a question from the that's just cropped up and in, in, um, um, from the audience here um, from from Anthony Murphy, um, who's challenging us here, challenging us. He's saying, aren't the panelists projecting too much from ancient Rome onto today's political situation? They are totally different, and he quite rightly points out. Um, he thinks maybe the Nero Trump analogy is spurious. What have, have we been too glib here, or do you think there are, there are We've, we're secure in um, noticing echoes and resonances. Talk well, I, th I think I, I think it's I think it's kind of uh, mildly valid because, as I said, the American Republic consciously modelled itself on the Roman Republic. Of course, I mean the differences are, are just astronomically profound, but it has meant that um, the <laughs> The, the sense of nostalgia for a kind of rugged Republican virtue that ran through the Roman Republic, I think to that extent, is a kind of living tradition within the American Republic as well, which is why, I mean, I, I don't think there's any parallel whatsoever between Nero and, and Boris Johnson or, you know, Jeremy Corbyn still less. But I think in the case of the United States, there is perhaps just a kind of glimmering of a justification for comparing the, these two obviously incredibly different systems. Um, OK, so one thing I just do want to ask Will, actually, is um, just to turn to something slightly different, is like what are, with populism, what are the stakes? <clears throat> I mean, is, that, can, is it easy to come back from populism? And to reinstate a well kind of i mean it's first of all you know, go back to what is, I, it a kind of, is it is it something that can blow up in your face i mean um and you know you could bite off more than you can chew and and civil unrest and all the rest of it i mean what yeah i mean so first of all the, as i was saying at the beginning <laughs> within the kind of textbook uh, understanding of populism it's a style of rhetoric and it's a style of leadership and lots of people have been accused of populism thatcher was accused of populism um, at certain points to do with you know the right to buy was seen as a populist measure by some people actually going back to 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 um uh, uh, the, the point about the um you know the the, the pejorative sense of the i now don't can't remember the latin word popular popular um <laughs> but you know that this is a kind of a, a only used as a pejorative term um populism tends to be used as a pejorative term and that's why you know a lot of people particularly on the left resent being called populist because they feel like it's as, as, as you know like syriza and, and, and podemos and others have, have and less actually podemos actually have, have, have been fine with it but others have, have thought that this is just a way of sort of dismissing dem democracy you know well, it's not populism it's democracy and so it's worth remembering that i think the other thing is you know there are there are elements of populism all over the place where you mean that style of rhetoric of drawing that moralistic distinction between the kind of pure ordinary people and the sort of corrupt self-interested elite politicians are always doing this there are elements of it all over the place blair was also accused sometimes of being a populist um so it's a kind of a you could say it's a kind of a, 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 a sort of seed that you sort of scatter around the place um i think that the question is if if, if it turns into something where you're taking direct aim at the basic institutions of civil society, and, and, and obviously I'm talking in the liberal sense now, I mean, the term populism originates in the late 19th century in, in Kansas. It, it, it's, it's had a sort of resurgence over the last sort of 20 years. So I'm talking about something quite modern and recent. But where I suppose people become afraid 
is either where it um, starts to um, st become entangled with manifestly um, racist or other type of um, prejudicial um, ways of distinguishing that ordinary people, you know, oh, those people are not part of the ordinary people, they're, they're from somewhere else, they're, they're outside us for some reason. Uh, that's one, that's a danger. There are dangers of, of, of sort of resuscitating kind of pre-liberal or illiberal policies uh, surrounding um, uh, whatever it might be, the, the family or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, I think that where it takes direct aim at the institutions of liberal democracy and the, the foundations of civil society in some ways, whether it be, you know, the, I don't know, the you know, parliament or, 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 or public service broadcasters, whatever it might be. The question is, how real is that threat? Is it purely rhetorical and, and sort of, you know, kind of saber rattling or, or does it really threaten something much more severe? And there was a major debate um, in, in the United States amongst political scientists and political commentators as to whether the term fascist could be used to describe Trump. And there were some people who thought it could because he spoke like a fascist. That, that, that much was clear. He certainly spoke like a fascist. The question, and this is where historians such as Richard Evans came in and said, well, actually, you know, until there's actually, until he's actually taken control of the police and there is street violence and, and actual kind of you know this sort of you know, suspension of, of rule of law that term should not be used and so obviously that those are the those are the ultimate stakes is whether rule of law will be suspended um, and whether you actually start to close down the institutions of, of, of parliamentary liberal democracy those are the ultimate stakes we know that from the 20th century the question is whether speaking in this sort of quasi fascistic way of um, you know some people said that Farage's celebration speech on, on the night of the Brexit referendum was fascistic where he he said this is a victory for ordinary people well who did he mean by that he probably didn't mean you know various people who had been on the losing side of that and, and what did that mean but that was still in the domain of rhetoric and not in the domain of, of political or constitutional reform so um, i wanted to then catherine ask you about how dangerous it is i mean what you know that how fragile it is balancing but if 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 you're a roman emperor <laughs> Uh, or a Roman politician, um, being part of this very strange and it seems fragile balance between the people, um, the Senate, um, the, the figure of the emperor, when all these forms are in flux and the whole, as has been pointed out, that sort of the whole kind of clever thing that Augustus did was to retain the forms of um, traditional government, accreting to himself uh, numerous, numerous, numerous titles so that he became sort of everything and um, all at once, um, but claiming to be restoring traditional values, but at the same time playing this kind of um, interesting game with autocracy. Um, perhaps you could respond to that not very elegant question, Catherine. Well, I mean, I think it is, you're, you're absolutely right, that it is a very sort of fragile balance. And it is one where a lot of things are not fully articulated. And indeed, the position of the emperor is something that's not really spelled out until the time when Vespasian comes to power. And they actually then, at that point, have a law on exactly what Vespasian's rights and duties are. That's the first time it's properly spelled out. And um, before that, it's just this sort of, you know, the, the natural personal authority of Augustus, you know, uh, who been successful in all those civil wars and kind of killed all his enemies or forgiven others um, that, that kind of holds the thing together and then his successors who very in various ways imperfectly kind of occupy that that place I mean in a way we don't have a sort of sense of robust um, institutions uh, in the way that we do in modern liberal democracies. I mean, you know, Tiberius sort of does away with the elections for consuls. They just get chosen by other members of the Senate. So the Senate ha is uh, seen as a repository of traditional Roman authority and a sort of bastion of, um, of, of kind of um, legitimacy. Um, senators are the people who go out and govern Roman provinces. They're the people who who um, who who command Roman armies. So any emperor really needs those people on side. Um, but then there's also but exactly what the kind of balance of of 
responsibilities and authority is between the emperor and the senate is this very sort of tricky um an undefined kind of area the emperor is meant to consult the senate the senate is deferential to the emperor tastus talks about how the senate start behaving like slaves in relation to the emperor tiberius because they just agree to whatever they think he wants so it's a very difficult dynamic of anticipating what you think the emperor wants or sort of self-enslaving of, of of the senate and um what what we see with nero is a kind of you know i can't really be bothered with the senate um he there's a sort of wonderful moment in suetonius where nero's um inaugurating the works on the isthmus of corinth it's a great sort of um slightly megalomaniac public work scheme to sort of cut through the isthmus um and he does it he 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 he, he sort of makes vows in the name of the Roman people and himself and he leaves out the Senate and that's seen as a very sort of conspicuous kind of sidelining of of the Senate in a way that they're and then obviously that's um, then he, he's supposedly kind of has executed loads of senators on the grounds that they're involved in conspiracies to to kill him and that becomes the sort of the, the dominant theme of, of the, the latter years of his reign um, and then unsurprisingly um, that they're not terribly keen to support him by that point and but he also and the other kind of crucial thing about the Roman Emperor is his relationship to the army I mean that's kind of somewhat occluded by Augustus towards in the latter years of his reign but is absolutely fundamental for underpinning the Emperor and and Nero is just not interested in the army at all so he, he doesn't want to speak to them as I mentioned earlier he, he kind of he, he's not interested in you know when when Vindex revolts Nero kind of doesn't want to hear about it because he's busy with his music. Um, it, it, so it's, it's this sort of, uh, you know, it, it, really the whole business of, of government is extremely tedious for Nero. He doesn't really want to think about it. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of mixture of not taking seriously the traditional concerns of Roman politics, um, but also at certain points apparently kind of really distorting the, the kind of balance, the very precarious balance um, that, that had traditionally existed between those, those different bodies which are rather sort of tensely interconnected. Yeah, never ignore the army if you're a, a, an autocrat I'd say that seems to be quite a crucial part of the retaining power. Um, there have been a couple of questions about Agrippina um, and um, that's good because I wanted to ask about Agrippina. So Agrippina was um, Nero's mother who was very elaborately killed as Tom described, um, one of my favourite sort of parts of the mythical, well or not mythical story is, is Nero's construction or his commission to uh, construct a collapsible, a special self-collapsing boat that would drown Agrippina, but Max Cody-like, she kind of flails her way to the shore. Um, um, so I'm, I'm interested in, in, and this is a special area of yours, Catherine, having written about the, 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 the figures of the, the, the women um, around Julio um, Claudian court, who, you know, in, in Tacitus and well, particularly in Suetonius are kind of wonderfully powerful, scheming, uh, incredible women, and um, uh, is that really true? Is that really what they were like? Well, or is this all a kind of, you know, again, a kind of elite myth making um, in which uh, we can tell how dreadful all these people were because their, their, their wives uh, were kind of interfering in politics? Well, um, that's, I mean, it's very interesting because I think the, the exhibition uh, goes for the sort of latter narrative that it, you know there's no reason to suppose that Agrippina had any influence at all um, and the only reason that Nero had her killed was because um, he was under pressure because her perceived influence made him unpopular and so therefore he had his mother murdered um, this seems I, I mean I, I, I think I mean that's perhaps a little bit of a parody of, of the position in the exhibition but I think um, uh, that seems to me somewhat implausible. Um, I mean, I think it's absolutely right to say that the influence of um, women in the imperial family is resented by the senatorial elite. Part of the reason it's resented is because it makes absolutely palpable the fact that power is inherited, that it matters who your mother is. That's become tremendously significant. Um, Nero is um, 
Nero's part, a significant part of Nero's claim to 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 have the right to be emperor is that he's descended from Augustus, but he's descended from Augustus through his mother Agrippina, who is um, Augustus' great granddaughter. So it's it's you know, she's crucially important. Um, but at the same time, we could also imagine that you know, as a sixteen-year-old, um, you know, when he comes to power, it's not surprising if he relies on his his mother who has the experience of having been um not only the the wife of the previous emperor but also the sister of the one before that um and who is who is you know, emerged as an as an extraordinary survivor so um there's a you know there's a good reason to suppose that nero and would have deferred to a degree to to his mother and would have been you know quite wise to do so really um and she is, is certainly presented as uh, Mtastus in particular, I think, sees her authority as entirely sort of improper and kind of presents us with these scenes of her sort of muscling in, trying to kind of, you know, lay claim to the to to the to the sort of authority of her, of her ancestors, but he, he, he presents that as being completely wrong because, you know, because she's a woman and really only senators should be exercising power. What about you, Tom? Are you a believer in the collapsible boat story? It's too good not to believe in it. <laughs> <laughs> when in doubt, believe them in. <laughs> Will, I, I mean, I, I, it seems it seems like it is a pretty long-standing trope, though. I mean, this this is slightly aside from populism as such, um, to be fair, but that. Um, if, if things are if things are a bit doubtful about, or if one doesn't really like one's current uh, political leader, um, attention might fall rather slightingly on the wife, uh, particularly if they seem to have a mind of their own, and that's you know as much true of Sherry Blair as 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 kind of Carrie. Yeah, no, I, that, that's right. I mean, it's it's not a um, it, it's probably not something that is is, is specific to, to 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 this populist um, moment or this populist mode. But I think that yeah, there's a that I guess this is a, a, a something that goes runs throughout political history, and 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 this 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 idea of there being uh, someone who's behind the scenes, who's actually in in power, and that and so on. And um, I mean, we we see it in Britain at the moment in relation to um, Carrie Johnson. I mean, this is um, uh, so it's it's a it's a that that in that sense there is a um, clearly this is a a fairly common uh, trope, I think. Um, I want to ask a question that's been offered from the audience, and it's about Putin. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee, so thank you, anonymous. But um, maybe, um, maybe you could think about this, Tom. As as Tsar or Caesar, mm -hmm. um, how is Putin? Putin. I'm not going to try and do a Russian accent. How is Vladimir Putin learning from classical populism? Do you think he is, Tom? Uh, no, probably not. But there is, of course, you know, Moscow is the third Rome in descent, line of descent from the second Rome, Constantinople, which in turn is in line of descent from uh, from the original Rome. So there is a kind of a, perhaps a, a slight element there. I mean, I think what what is what, the, the the time when the classical inheritance I think did impact on Putin was the annexation of Crimea, which um, was uh, settled by the Greeks. And prior to the um, the invasion of Crimea, there was a tremendous posed shot of Putin going out scuba diving in the Black Sea and miraculously discovering a Greek amphora, which had hitherto, you know, who knew? There it was. Um, but the real reason why um, uh, why, why the Crimea mattered to, um, to to Putin was that it was the location where um, Vladimir uh, became Christian. Uh, and got accepted into the Orthodox Church. Um, and so there is this, um, pre, pre, the ruler who, who prior to Putin had an to Crimea was Catherine the Great. And there's a letter that Potemkin writes to Catherine saying, you are now the mistress of the Crimea, which you know is our link to uh, the world of, of Alexander and Pompey the Great, but also the, the, the birthplace of, of, of Russian Christianity. Um, and so I think it's telling that um, you know the, the propaganda that surrounded that you did have you had Putin with the, with the Greek amphora, but you also had Russian priests kind of blessing fighter planes before they set off. And so that sense of 
uh, that, that Putin was situating that campaign definitely, um, you know, in the context of the deep past of 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 Russia. But I think in general, no. I mean, Russia is uh, stands at a, a remove from from the Latin world, and it's important that um, Russia culturally is not, say, a part of of Latin Christendom. Connected, sort of connected with that question, um, um, Alex Vios. Forgive me if I've mispronounced that name, Alex. Um, asks to what extent being cast in the role of the beast caused Nero to accrete so many subsequent bad reputations. So, yeah, that's a good question about how how far this kind of whole thing about you know <laughs> being mean to Christians and um, has has really has been absolutely kind of enormous in in his subsequent reception. Is uh, what would you say to that, Catherine? Well, I mean, I do think it's always very striking that, you know, yes, you know, I, I often received inquiries from people who say, well, we're making a series about the 10 most evil men in history, and obviously we're going to do a programme about Nero. Uh, uh, so, and it's, it's somehow that you sort of think, well, actually, you know, I, I think, you know, if you're going to think about mass murderers, um, it, yes, Nero is alleged to have bumped off quite a lot of Roman senators, but really in the great scheme of things, you know, is he... Um, quite as bad as as, as uh, some of the other candidates one might find. I mean, and, and I think really the the stories about Nero and the Christians are completely crucial for that. And, and, and the whole sort of the, the kind of early Christian churches um, kind of reconfiguring of Nero. And, and Tom will know much more about this than I do. But I but I think it is it is a really important part of his reputation in the 19th century is again we, we kind of come back to that that the sort of Nero as Nero's role in in the persecution of the Christians as as a sign completely um uh crucial aspect of his of his reputation as as you know, one of um history's most evil men I mean obviously the the, the stories about the fire um you know fiddling while Rome burned uh, it is it, it kind of a key element in 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 the tradition and and bumping off his relatives some people think that's worse than other people but um you know that's that but but the christians i think is 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 a, it, it is very important to 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 see that as uh, um kind of inflecting looming, looming very large i mean tom um as catherine says if that but that maybe you'd like to respond to that i mean obviously you've written about the uh, first thousand years of christianity in your uh well, 2000 years of Christianity in your book, opinion. Um, so how influential, you know, how big a stumbling block is that between us and understanding Nero in a sense? I, I think it's been absolutely crucial because, um, I mean, Tacitus is forgotten for a long stretch of, of, of the Middle Ages and Suetonius kind of survives by, by a, a thread. But um, Nero's reputation as the man who, who puts Peter and Paul to death is fundamental to his, you know, to, because when 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 um, uh, when when the Roman Empire in the West falls, the status of Rome as the capital of Christendom is is dependent not really on the fact that it had been, you know, the imperial capital. Although that does have a kind, you know, it has a kind of resonance still, but really it's dependent on the fact that the relics of uh, of, of St. Peter in particular are there, but also of St. Paul. And so therefore, the status of Nero as the man who ordered them put to death is kind of central to the status of Rome as the capital of medieval Christendom. Um, and, and therefore, it feeds into art and um, all kinds of stories. And I think that you see the kind of enduring effect of that right the way up into a kind of film like Quo Vadis, where, you know, it's it's a crucial part of the the kind of monstrosity of the part played by Peter Ustinov that you have this kind of Christian context set it against. And in a sense, I mean, even even with um, you know the, the 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 fading of doctrinal Christianity, I think that that the Hollywood epics still have this need to contextualize the evil of Roman emperors. So if you look at Gladiator, uh, it's not a Christian. But you do have um, Derek Jacobi playing somebody who rather improbably wants to restore the Republic, which is cast as being the equivalent of a kind of, you know, a liberal democracy or something. So it seems pretty much you can't have an epic featuring an evil Roman emperor without a Christian or a liberal providing some co contextualization for him. 
<laughs> it's another reminder of our, our you know inability to untangle ourselves from the present moment when looking back at the, this deep past and susan biddle um in the uh, uh um, audience member says um our analogies are always driven by our own circumstances in the 1930s um were comparisons drawn um between fascist leaders and nero in for instance in relation to public works e.g autobahns italian trains and improvements to porters rebuilding Ber berlin and rome nazi rallies compared with neronian games and entertainment and so on it, it, it um who can speak to the reception of roman emperors and nero in the 1930s um yeah. catherine well, I mean, it, it's, it's very striking that particularly Mussolini, but also Hitler, are, are very um, preoccupied with the, the model of the ancient Romans. Um, Mussolini has the good fortune of, of the bimillennium of the birth of Augustus um, and falling in 1937. And there's a huge amount of money goes into archaeology and, and into projecting Mussolini as uh, the, the new Augustus, this is the return of Roman greatness and so on. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't know whether any of Mussolini's critics chose to cast him rather as Nero, it might have been a tempting, um, tempting uh, critique to, to adopt, but it's absolutely the case that, that Roman parallels were to the forefront and there's a sort of, there's some amazing pictures of Hitler visiting Rome, uh, visiting Rome to, to see this great new exhibition of, of Romanness, which was put on to celebrate the bimillennium and, and Hitler and Mussolini are going around this together, kind of savouring um, the, the wholesome Roman past. I mean, it is, but it's a Roman past that's about kind of, you know, building up young men to be a, um, a fighting force rather than kind of decadent parties. Um, so, so they're not very interested in in that, you know, that, that that sort of Neronian tradition is not one that they invoke themselves. I mean, I think it's absolutely true that our our understanding of ancient Rome is mediated through many different reinterpretations of it. And I would say that um, the fascist reinterpretation of it is an absolutely primal one. I mean, the the, the you know the very name fascism obviously uh, is deriving from Rome, uh, and in a sense. Um, you know, the readiness to call uh, Trump a, fa a fascist is kind of tribute to that, I think. The the way in which, because the Nazis themselves were modeling themselves on Rome, so there is a kind of distorted echo of Rome in that comparison. I think I think it says something about Nero's historical reputation that, that people did, you know, that, that, that no fascist, no Nazi ever compared um, Mussolini or Hitler to uh, to Nero because that wasn't the kind of reputation that you want. And and Nero, uh, you know, Hitler was was uh, was a rather uh, you know ascetic man um, who who disapproved of the kind of stuff that uh, that Nero got up to. Um, and I think that um, in a way it kind of serves as a reminder that one of the things about Nero, and it sounds a kind of a, a, a terrible thing to say about a guy who killed his mother and castrated boys and did all kinds of terrible things. But he does have this slight sense that he was fun. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> he's uh, a fun, you know, he's a, he, I, because if the comparison is with Caligula, Caligula, I think, is, is seen as, as a terrifying figure. He's the terrifying figure of the tyrant. I mean, Nero also is terrifying, but he, he you have the slight sense that his, his, his antics can be played for comic effect. Which is why Peter Ustinov's role is 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 so entertaining. That, and one of the you know, the ways in which he's been reinterpreted over recent decades in 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 the academic field is that that sense of fun is, is something that Nero is very self consciously playing with. So in 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 the Peter Ustinov performance, you know, he's a risible figure. He's a kind of comic. He's a grotesque. Um, more recently, people have argued that actually he's, he knows exactly what he's doing and he's playing these roles and he's kind of riffing off it. Um, but that, that, you know, when he's, he's, um, he's kind of entertaining people, when he's, he's playing the liar or whatever, he's, he, he's, he's, he's doing it because um, he knows the effect that it will have. And I mean, I actually think that, that probably he was, he was quite good at the liar simply because there were pretenders who 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 
reappeared after his death, claiming to be Nero. And one of the attributes that they had to have was a, a facility with the lion. Um, uh, so there's Lambert Simnel type figures, but more musical. Um, the, <laughs> um, uh, here's one for you, I think, really well, um, which uh, from Peter George, who perhaps slightly wearily is engaging with our kind of our, our, our insistence on talking about Trump in this session. But he, <laughs> he says, if we're going to continue the analogy between Trump and Nero, um, can we call Mike Pence the Seneca figure in that he tries to round out some of Trump's rougher edges and make him more acceptable to the notion of the republic? So maybe a way of thinking about that, like, yeah, what, what was Mike Pence's role in the kind of whole Trump arrangement, Will? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of attempt to kind of normalise or, or, or sort of quest to slightly normalise things. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how expertly I can really comment on that. I mean, it, it, um, uh, Pence did obviously have to try to act as a kind of a bridge to yes the rest of the kind of constitutional sort of arms of government and to to inject some kind of um sort of vague normality into proceedings um just want to think i mean you know I, 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 and i and i'm <laughs> i'm not hugely invested in the particular analogy beyond some of the kind of comments that that tom's already already made which i think is very interesting to think about the sort of um, ways in which these echoes are actually kind of by design in some sense um, but no, I think it's an it's an interesting point. I mean, it's um, the, 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 yeah. I mean, the Pence figure is, is very interesting, and of course, it is also Pence eventually became the target of the mob for reasons that I mentioned earlier, because Pence was the one who eventually kind of accepted that ultimately, you know, Trump would have to to, to leave office, and he was the one who was um, you know working, he was cooperating with the Senate, and um, uh, that and that's why there was this kind of mob which was allegedly seeking to actually string him up as they stormed around Capitol Hill on, on January the 6th. So, um, I mean, there's a certain, you know, there's an interesting kind of morality tale surrounding Pence throughout all of this. And Pence now, actually, because it's a sort of a, it seems to be a kind of necessary um, kind of criterion for being, getting anywhere in the Republican Party now, is sort of now totally back on board with the whole kind of Trump cult by the sound of things, despite the fact that he he was actually um, targeted by by all of this. So, but it's, it's an interesting, perhaps I, others might be able to talk about the Seneca analogy more. <laughs> Well, actually, I, what I'd like to do is just quickly ask you one one other quick question, Will, and then I'm going to ask you all a very good question, which um, has come from the audience, which cuts to the whole point. So um, Fiona Banson asks, does Nero's popularity necessarily make Nero a populist? So, Will, could you talk to this, mm. you, know, or pop, you know, where does popularity end and populism yeah, I mean, I think so, you know, again, populism is a, is a term associated with, with modern liberal democracies, which run elections, and that certain people are criticised for uh, um, seeking to kind of circumvent the normal ways of, of winning by taking some, finding some other channels, often involving the media, often involving their own private money, such as Trump, often maybe using Facebook, whatever it might be, that on some level, uh, popularity has been kind of uh, kind of instrument of being sort of weaponized, if you like, in, in order to kind of win by 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 sort of uh, un, unfair means. Um, I think that in a in a in a in a political system which is not a, a mass democracy, uh, the mean the, you know the, the term populism obviously can't really be used in the same way because it, it loses all of those sorts of implications. I mean, the, you know, so but I mean, uh, popularity obviously. Um, uh, yes, I think that um, popularity, at least popular recognition, popular renown in some way, matters greatly to populists. This is why, you know, there's endless debates about whether it should, whether um, someone from the, you know, the British National Party, when Nick Griffin went on Question Time, hosted by the BBC, um, whatever that was, about 15 years ago or so, you know, that was an incredibly controversial issue. Because although Nick Griffin's ideas, he, the, the then leader of the British National Party, might be very uh, offensive to the vast majority of people, it granted him the first step towards um, popularity, which is at least being kind of popularly recognised. In a sense, so the idea is that you should sort of remove the oxygen of publicity from from figures if they are considered to be beyond the pale. So, so popularity and, and democracy obviously have a kind of complicated relationship. 
Thank you, Will. That was that was really nicely put. Um, I um, OK, I have a quite this is my last question. And I'm going to do a quick fire round to all of you. Um, and it's from anonymous. <laughs> Another anonymous attendee. Ultimately, do you personally, it says, do you personally think Nero is deserving of his reputation as a tyrant? Catherine. Oh, I find it very difficult, really, because I, I, I'm afraid I, I kind of, I feel that what I study is the myth, really, rather than the man, and, and I'm not sure we can really get at the man. What I, I'm interested in the whole sort of set of discourses around representing emperors and kind of how we then kind of weigh them on the scales, if you like, to determine whether they're truly tyrants or not. I mean, what kind of definition of tyrant do we want to use? Um, uh, yeah, so, so that, I'm, oh, I'm, you're squirming, I'm squirming. I'm a typical <laughs> professor of history. Sorry. Right. Uh, Will, and you're, and now that you've dipped your term into the world. <laughs> I'm on a very steep learning curve when it comes to Nero, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I think uh, I, I've, I've been to the fabulous exhibition and I've, I've, I've been uh, uh, trying to learn what I can as I, as I go along. I mean, I was just trying to think what the, the precise definition of a tyrant is, and I suppose one would associate it with someone who uses fear and uses power and uses violence in a way that is um, kind of clearly disproportionate, is um, used in order to, to sow fear and to, um, to, 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 that has a kind of an erratic nature to it, if you like. I mean, all of the stories I've heard so far suggest someone who um, may have been extremely comfortable with violence, though I suspect that wasn't, it wasn't unique in, 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 those, um, in that respect. Um, but the, in each case, there was something quite sort of strategic about it. Um, I mean, I don't know whether others could comment whether he actually had a kind of a love of, of violence or a sort of celebration of violence. Um, and, and I think that's the perhaps one of the, the, the questions that that, that, that question, you know, invite. I mean, you know, how we define a tyrant is, is the big question. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice, nice get out. Tom? <laughs> well, I think I think that, you know, our moral standards over the course of the past 2000 years have evolved so profoundly. They are so utterly different from those that govern the Roman world that by our standards, I think any Caesar would, would be regarded as a kind of monstrous figure. I, I, I mean, I, of course, Nero is, the, the real Nero is almost impossible to get hold of, but, but he was clear, I would, I'm happy to say, I think he was clearly an appalling man. Um, no matter how much he, you know, the, uh, the senators and the Christians, whatever, might be, he, he, he clearly did terrible things. But having said that, um, he was awful, but I quite like him. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that, on that cheery note, I think we, we must draw things to uh, a conclusion. Um, I think we've learned that populism is a useful, if limited, ultimately, lens through which to, to see Nero. And I hope that we have drawn out some kind of interesting things to think about or think with in relation to, to Nero. And um, the exhibition um, continues until the 24th of October, not until next week, as I erroneously, I think, said at the beginning of this uh, event. Um, the exhibition continues until the 24th of October, and um, if you haven't seen it, I, I urge you to do so. It is absolutely fascinating, and there are things that are so beautifully displayed and just a huge amount to look at, so I, I, I highly recommend it. Um, and I would uh, now like to uh, thank our panellists again. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Tom. And thank you to everybody who attended uh, distantly but close to us online this British Museum event. Thank you very much and goodbye.